So uh, I'm just here. I'm just here to kind of introduce Andrew. So I was going to tell you a little story about him. twelve years ago. Andrew knows the numbers better than me. I get my numbers mixed up sometimes. Well, what story are you telling? <laughs> so about twelve years ago, Andrew came up and spent a summer with me, and uh, I was actually winding my business down a little bit when he came. So. Uh, I probably wasn't going to hit 140 deals. I was only going to maybe do 100 that year. And uh, so he thought that what I was doing was crazy, you know, like. So, but somehow or other, it must have twigged something. And a couple of years later, he gets licensed. And so 10 years ago, he comes and starts working with us. And you guys, are, anybody, everybody not heard Andrew before? I haven't heard. Oh, really? A few people haven't yeah. heard Andrew before. Well, the guy you hear this morning is not the guy that started 10 years ago, because I was listening to him. It was about three weeks ago, about a month ago. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, geez, this guy has, uh, he's been doing some serious thinking and some reading and developing. And uh, it, it made me think of an email I got this morning from one of the gals in the office. Like, you're you're going to have to interview her. But she came to one of our business planning sessions, one of the gals in the, in the Abbotsford office, and she said, Ray, I started to do what you said in the goal setting session. And I started to, to take about 10, 15 minutes a day for myself to think and to write some goals down. She's been doing it every day since the middle of January. She's been knocking off three deals a month. She did three deals in January, three deals in February. And last week, she landed a 72-unit development. Wow. Oh, nice. 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 Just because she started thinking a little bit and writing down stuff every day that she wants to accomplish. So sometimes it's not, you know, what, what you need to do to be able to improve is not, is is maybe hard? Maybe a little is not that hard, but it's it's easy not to do as well. Easy to do, easy not to do. Mm -hmm. So, help me welcome. I don't uh, I don't know. I have no idea what Randy is going to talk on this morning. So I, I I have a topic, but I don't I don't know what he's going to do. But I know we're going to enjoy it. We're going to go for about an hour, have a coffee break, and uh, see what happens after the coffee break. So please help me welcome from Abbotsford, Mr. Andrew Bracewell. <laughs> <laughs> The kingdom was in peril. Many years earlier, the reign of the king had begun with, gun, had begun with so much promise and prosperity and good fortune for all in the land. But as was so often the case in kingdoms of their ancestors, the commoners had lost all respect for the king and his time of reign was over. The kingdom was not only vulnerable, but there were whispers of an uprising. The people were divided by classes, their birth lines, and where they lived in the land. In all the years before, the king had risen from the same caste, born of only a few bloodlines, and always from the people of the north. In the birth of this great kingdom, much blood had been shed, and it was always those from the north that forced their will upon those of the southern colonies. It is for this reason that the assembly about to take place had the ability to bring a nation together or cause it to crumble under civil unrest. Who would be the new king? A historic day was about to unfold. Rulers near and far awaited anxiously as word spread throughout the lands. Out of the throngs of democracy, a new king had risen from the south. So much hung in the balance. Young and old from both sides of the ledger stood still in anticipation of what the new king would say about his kingdom and what he would say to his people. History would never be the same again. Except for one thing, 
Ann Nixon Cooper is 106 years old. She was born just a generation past slavery, a time when there were no cars on the road or planes in the sky, when someone like her couldn't vote for two reasons, because she was a woman and because of the color of her skin. And tonight, I think about all that she's seen throughout her century in America, the heartache and the hope, the struggle and the progress, the times we were told that we can't, the people who pressed on with that American creed, yes, we can. At a time when women's voices were silenced and their hopes dismissed, she lived to see them stand up and speak out and reach for the ballot. Yes, we can. When there was despair in the Dust Bowl and depression across the land, she saw a nation conquer fear itself with a new deal, new jobs, a new sense of common purpose. Yes, we can. When the bombs fell on our harbor and tyranny threatened the world, she was there to witness a generation rise to greatness and a democracy was saved. Yes, we can. She was there for the buses in Montgomery, the hoses in Birmingham, a bridge in Selma, and a preacher from Atlanta who told the people that we shall overcome. Yes, we can. A man touched down on the moon. A wall came down in Berlin. A world was connected by our own science and imagination. And this year, in this election, she touched her finger to a screen and cast her vote. Because after 106 years in America, through the best of times and the darkest of hours, she knows how America can change. Yes, we can. America, we have come so far. We have seen so much, but there's so much more to do. So tonight, let us ask ourselves, if our children should live to see the next century, if my daughters should be so lucky to live as long as Ann Nixon Cooper, what change will they see? What progress will we have made? This is our chance to answer that call. This is our moment. This is our time to put our people back to work and open doors of opportunity for our kids, to restore prosperity and promote the cause of peace, to reclaim the American dream and reaffirm that fundamental truth that out of many we are one, that while we breathe, we hope, and where we are met with cynicism and doubt and those who tell us that we can't, we will respond with that timeless creed that sums up the spirit of a people. Yes, we can. Thank you. God bless you. And may God bless the United States of America. Yes, we can. <laughs> Communicating with intent and purpose. That is one of the greatest pieces of communication in modern history. And I don't stand in front of you today saying that I'm a Republican or a Democrat or making any kind of play for Barack Obama. <laughs> if anything, I'd probably categorize myself as a Republicrat if there was such a thing. But what Barack did in that fall, I think it was, of 2008, when the world was watching, and everybody, no matter what side of the ledger they stood on, Republican, Democrat, black, white, old, young, Latino, black, whatever. He took that moment and he seized it. And we're going to talk about why he seized it and what he was able to accomplish in that moment. So what did the king do in three minutes and 30 seconds? He told an inspirational story that people can connect with. Write that down, number one. America has a lot of history, and Barack touched on something and shared a story that everybody in the audience, I mean, you saw the, the, the panning of the, uh, of, of, the, uh, of the cameras, I mean, there was tears in people's eyes, the emotion was real, people were on the edge of their seats, and he grabbed something from history, brought it to their attention, 
and shared a story. And he went, you know, if there was ever a moment that it was only in people's heads, he went from their heads to their heart with that story that he shared. We have, uh, you know, we're not maybe running for president, um, you know, in our in our day to day jobs. But we have these moments where we're in front of our clients, and um, and you know, people are on the edge of their seat. They're nervous. Big decisions are about to unfold, and, um, and you know, you have these moments where you know you've got to have the ability to go from the facts, the head knowledge, to the heart. And a great way to do that is to is to share an inspirational story. I'll share one with you. Um, I'm in a moment uh, this past week where I'm sitting at a at a at a, ta a dining room table of some clients. They're they're getting ready for a significant move, a job transfer. They're moving from one city to another one that's quite a ways away. And you know they they share with me that that they're really concerned. They're concerned that their home is going to sell in time. They're concerned that some of the things and, and features of their home are going to become you know a problem when when the buyer comes along. And they don't know how we're going to overcome those obstacles. All of these concerns that they had are very, very real. And in that moment, when Barack is standing up there and he's, and, he's, and he's talking to the masses, there are still very, very real concerns that he couldn't answer at the moment, right? The economy's crumbling. There's, they're, they're on the verge of civil unrest in, in, in some states of the South. Um, people are jobless. You know, if you've just come through, you know, one of the hugest financial crises in, in, in recorded history. He doesn't take that moment to try to come up with all the answers. Rather, he grabs onto something in the past that everybody can relate to and shares an inspirational story. So in that moment, when I'm sitting with my clients and they've got this look of concern on their face, what do I do? I reach back into my bag and I share with them an inspirational story. A story of somebody else's victory that hopefully they can feel like they take ownership of. So I shared with them something that happened just in the last month. I said, hey guys, you know what? I understand that things are challenging today. I understand that you know some of these things you're raising about your property, these are real concerns. And you know what? I don't have all the answers today. But here's what I can tell you. These people, Bob and Linda, whatever the, you know, whatever the names are, they were very much in your position. In fact, they were a young family, young children. They were making a significant move. They had some of these concerns as well. Here's what we did. We addressed those concerns. We did what we needed to do. And guess what? Here's what they experienced. And I shared their success story. Now, does that change the circumstances of the people I'm talking to? No. But sharing an inspirational story of the past can provide hope for the future. Sometimes it's just our job to help people see beyond the challenge of the day. You can't answer the challenges of the day. You, you know, some of those things are just going to walk out, right? We don't, we don't know. We don't know what it's going to be like. But we can help take their vision off today's problem to the future by sharing a story. Number two, what else did Barack do? He used people's names. This is powerful. Ann Nixon Cooper, 106 years old. The moment he did that, the story went from the hypothetical the to the personal. Absolutely. Became very, very, very real. And you know, if, if, the, if the camera had been panning along the audience in that moment, and maybe it was, I mean, you would have seen people are 100% engaged. Because now, you know, it's not, this isn't a fairy tale. This is a real life person who's lived through. I mean, he, he went through the list, right? And 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 was couldn't vote because she was a woman. She couldn't vote because of the color of her skin. She's watched the development of cars, airplanes. She's watched people touch on the moon. She has seen civil war. This is a real individual who then what? Touches her finger to the screen, and has the ability to bring change to the country. But why is the story impactful? Because he uses their name. It's so important. When, 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 when the stakes are high and the pressure's on to use people's names both you know, when, you're, when you're speaking to them and when you're using these stories. It takes it from the hypothetical to the real very, very quickly. When you use a person's real name, it makes it easier for the listeners to own the story. If you write that down.
when you use a person's name, it makes it easier for the listeners or your audience to own the story. What did Brock do next? He leaned on historical victories and challenges to provide inspiration. Leaned on historical victories and challenges to provide inspiration. So some of the things he mentioned were women getting the vote, depression, war, civil unrest, putting a man on the moon, the Berlin Wall. Now, what's significant or most interesting about all these things that he went through? None of these things actually had anything to do with Barack Obama. Yet somehow, in the way he communicates these things, you would almost think that you know he gets to take credit for it, or you know it, it, it's his thing. And why is that? Because we have the ability to do this in two, one of two ways. We can lean on our own historical victories and challenges, which sometimes people, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, people will refer to those as personal anecdotes, and those are really, really valuable. But what can even be more powerful is owning the challenges and victories of your group. And all of us have the ability to do that. We all have associations, whether it be our country's association, our you know smaller cultures association, or maybe our church, our office that we work in. You know, we all belong to these subgroups within our culture, and we have the ability to own those victories. And and in a strange way, I don't want to say take credit, but when the moment's right, lean on them to be able to provide hope, promise for the future, which is exactly what Obama did. You know, we're in situations where, you know, our, uh, our you know, your, your clients are looking to you um, for answers. And I know it can be challenging when you're new or newer in, in, in your respective industries because you don't have a collection of these stories. You don't have something personal that you can draw on immediately and say, well, I've done this before and here's how I did it. It's really, really important to have those stories, have those anecdotes prepared ahead of time. And they're not yours, but you can own them because they belong to the group or the people or the company that you associate with. And that's, I mean, this isn't a, a, a plug for, for my own uh, agency in any way, although Ray wouldn't mind this, but that's one of the things that's so powerful about Remax if you're a real estate agent. I mean, you have the ability to plug into the most powerful real estate company in the world. And the victories and the, and the awards and, and the press that come with that are fantastic. Um, you plug into that, you lean on those victories and those challenges, and then you own those. And you know that, that helps you walk through those moments. Lastly, what did he do? Obama focused on the future to provide hope. And he used one of the most powerful things that you can use. He spoke of what? Our children. After he goes through this soliloquy of, you know, Anne Nixon Cooper and the challenges that she faced and the fact that she made it to the touchscreen computer, probably a Mac, and touched her finger, there's there's still this moment where it's like, well, well, what now? Great, Anne Nixon Cooper did this. She voted. Well, awesome, Barack. We 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 are still in debt crisis. We still have no jobs. We we still have civil unrest. What did, did he talk about those things? No. He says, but what will we say to our children? What will we tell them? Should they be lucky enough to live for 100 years? And he takes the focus off today and puts it out there. And who doesn't? Who can't get excited about the thought of their children down the road? Mm -hmm. That's enough to make you get up out of your seat and say, yes, we can. Mm -hmm. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. I said this earlier, but I'll say it again. One of your most important jobs as a communicator is to help people see beyond today and into the future.
So here's a practical example of how this works in, um, in, in you know, some of the industries represented in the room today. Um, you know, whether you're a mortgage broker or a real estate agent, you're, you're meeting with a client and the goal is to, is to get somewhere. But there are some challenges in between here, where they are, and getting to that point. And you know these, these challenges are the, are the types of challenges that can make or break a situation and determine whether or not a person actually moves forward and, and achieves what they're wanting to do. And so in that moment, you have the ability to do something like this. Mr. and Mrs. Jones, I hear exactly what you're saying because I've been there before or I've seen this before. And you know what, honestly, I don't have all the answers. We can't predict how every one of these things is gonna turn out. But here's what I know. You said to me that that school <coughs> in that neighborhood you wanna to get to is gonna be fantastic for your kids because of the arts program or because of the basketball team or because it means that you don't have to drive an hour every morning to get them there. Now you can only drive 10 minutes. And here's what I do know. When you reach that place, when you're there, when you live in that new home, your kids are gonna be thankful for fill in the blank. They see you more, they get to spend more time with you, they, they're, they're in that arts program that you really, really want for them, they're playing on that basketball team that they really, really wanna be a part of. But you're using that opportunity to what? Take your client's attention from the trials of today and point them to the hope of the future. And sometimes that's all it takes. That's all it takes for a person to, to, to get up out of their chair, you know, realize that, oh, okay, I can do this. I can do this. And I mean, in Barack's words, yes, we can. Yes, we can. Over and over and over. Well, how do we do that? We've got to look beyond the forest of today. We've got to see out into the future. And one of the best ways to inspire people about the future is kids. Who doesn't love kids? And kids impact most of us, right, in one way or another. Okay, so that's what Barack did. And, you know, I mean, I picked out those four things. Um, he did a lot more in that three minutes and 30 seconds. But, you know, what's, what's important to know is this. He was in a moment in time where he had listeners of all types, right? And, and we are in situations where we have listeners of all types. You're not always, you know, it's not always easy. You don't always have everyone in your, in your audience agreeing with you, right? He had opposition in, uh, in the crowd. He had people, you know, he had, basically the country was almost split 50-50. Half the people listening wanted them, and half the people listening didn't. So, you know, the stakes were high. But he seized the opportunity, and, and that is what today is about. You know, we're, we're talking about communication today. We have opportunities every day of the week in everything that we do. And you know, you don't always have all the answers. You're not always gonna have all the answers. You're not gonna, you're not gonna have everything figured out, but you can still seize the opportunity with sophisticated, eloquent, prepared communication with intent and purpose. Okay? So let's talk about some of the fundamentals. Know your intention. Too bad Cameron is, oh, Cameron is here for <laughs> He walked in late. Um, has anybody ever watched uh, somebody in martial arts bust through wood or concrete or yeah, anything like lots that? Lots of times, done it. Yeah, Cam Cameron, you, you probably, have you done it? Yeah. Okay, Cameron's done it. So I'm Great speaking to an time. issue to which I am now not an expert, and we have an expert in the audience, so you know, maybe I'll get corrected at some point in time. Thank but let, but let, me, let, me, let me give you my, um, my my version of how this takes place. When the martial artist walks up to the piece of wood or the piece of concrete, his intention is not, okay, am I doing this right? <laughs> am, I, am I bringing my arm down properly? His intention is not, okay, that's, that's the top of the wood. I better make sure I hit that hard enough. His intention, as it's been relayed to me through others, is he's looking beyond the object. He's looking below it. Yeah, and he is very, or she, is incredibly focused on the point of impact. And if I have this correct, I believe there's an, there's an outside bone in the hand here where the focus is, is that you're trying to make impact with the smallest point and all the force is going in through that point 
and you're going driving down through the wood or through the concrete. So we take that story and say, well, how does that translate into communication? We've got to know our intention. Meaning, you know, when you go into these moments, whether it's a, a meeting with a client or, or even a, it can be a random meeting that you're not as prepared for, you always have to have that goal in the back of your mind. What am I trying to relay? What am I trying to say? And if in that moment we're fumbling with the things like technique and tools and how to do it, then all of a sudden our focus is off of the intention and we're less likely, probably not likely, to break through that wood or break through that concrete. The, um, the fundamentals and, and techniques are the things that you know the, the martial artist can't be, can't be focusing on, right? He can't be focusing on the swing of his arm, the angle, anything like that. He's got to be focused on what's beneath. What am I going to? What's my goal here? And when we communicate, that has to be also what we're focusing on. So what could some of our intentions be? I'm asking you. What's an intention when you're in a meeting? <coughs> Another meeting. <laughs> that would be a bad intention. Intention to yeah. get new ideas. Say that again? To get new ideas or advice. Okay, well, let, let's talk specifically client. about your meeting with a client. Oh. What's an intention with a client? Help them. Business. Help them? Okay. No, know the concern. Yeah. Know their concern, oh. okay. Let's even get more specific. Sign a listing contract. Okay, that's a good one. Sign a listing contract. Or find out motivation. Um, understand what the driving force behind something is. These are things, you know, you go into these meetings, whether it's a first meeting with a buyer or a first meeting with a seller, you know, have these things top of mind. Know your intention top of mind. Then everything else that you're saying and doing is leading into that. Believe in your purpose. Okay. This is your why. Now, how many of you, there's a number of you in the room here who haven't heard me uh, speak before. Raise your hands. Okay, so this is going to be a bit, of a, uh, a bit of a jump for you, but those of you that were here, probably what, three or four maybe, when I was here in the fall? Understanding your why, this is, this is why you do <laughs> what you do. Quick synopsis on this. Most often in our industries, people have learned to communicate what they do and how they do it, but not why they do it. Okay? I'll give you my why. It's my goal in life to have a positive impact on as many people as possible. One of the ways I do this is teaching. In fact, the day I learned to teach was the day I stopped selling. Real estate just happens to be one of the ways I can accomplish this goal. I'll say that again. Mm -hmm. It's my goal in life to have a positive impact on as many people's lives as possible. One of the ways I do this is teaching. In fact, the day I learned to teach was the day I stopped selling. Real estate just happens to be a great way for me to accomplish this. So. Most often, we learn to communicate what it is we do and how we do it first, rather than the driving force, which should be why we do what we do, why we care about the things that we care about. And you'll oftentimes, in, whether it be in the real estate industry or the mortgage industry, you'll see it like this. 
buy with me or work with me and move for free. Number one agent in the town. Sold more than, you know, whoever. Yeah. Call me today. Answer my phone 24 hours a day. Never rest, never sleep, whatever. <laughs> you're, you're, you're telling people what you do and sometimes how you do it, but you never, ever, ever get to the why. And last time I was here a week ago, or sorry, a approximately a month ago, uh, we talked about this. This is a this is the brain. <laughs> For those of you who have never seen such an incredible drawing of the brain before, and we we broke down the brain into three categories. We said, and this is not this is not me who's come up with this. I mean, this is this is s roughly science. We'll say we have three components. We have the rational, the limbic, and the primitive. And here's what we know based on science. We know that our identity how we, our feelings, how we feel about ourselves, how we feel about others, how we, you know, derive what we're going to do with our lives is mostly developed in what we call the limbic brain, the emotional brain, okay? Primitive brain is like, I got to eat, I got to kill, I got to run, you know, this is, this is, you know, the, the essentials to life. The rational, this is stats, data, you know, we collect these things in order to make the decisions, but then most often, decisions reside in the limbic, the emotional. So, here's why I draw these things for you here today. When communicating with people, whether it be, you know, to an audience or to a one-on-one, -on -one, if we don't know our why, if we haven't established that, if you don't know your purpose, let alone believe in your purpose, what do we end up doing? We're just telling people what we do and how we do it. And the analogy that I've, I've used before and I used with you a month ago was, you know, having all the data in the world, having all the stats in the world, you, it, it's sometimes like just throwing nails against the board. You know, and you can have it all. You can have the best presentation. You can have all the comparable data, everything you need. You know, interest rates, this is what my lender can do. That's what this lender can do. And you're throwing them as hard as you can, but they're just bouncing off. Why are they bouncing off? Because probably you're lacking the emotion behind the content. Communication is roughly 20% what you know and 80% how you feel about what you know. So having a clear sense of your purpose and then believing in it is going to help you to communicate much, much clearer and with conviction to your audience and whoever you're speaking to. If you haven't started with this and you don't know why, you're doing what you're doing and I'll tell you right now to make money or to make a living that doesn't work it's got to go deeper than that but if you don't know why you're doing what you're doing how in the world do you expect your audience to buy into why you're doing what you're doing and if you don't learn to communicate your why then you become what's called a commodity and our industry is full of them. People can buy into you for one of two reasons. They can buy into you because they are inspired to or because they've been manipulated into it. And manipulations occur in the what and the how. I can get you the lowest interest rate. Why? Because I'm kicking in half my commission. <laughs> I'll list your home for more money than the other guy, and I'll work for less. You work with me, I'll buy you a moving truck. You do this, you get a free iPad. Come on out to this open house and we're doing a draw for fill in the blank. These are all what's and how's. You're telling people what you do it and how you do it, but at the end of the day, you're manipulating them. If you want to be able to inspire people, You've got to know your why. And the best example of that is the company Apple. 
they have created an absolute cult culture. And people own Apple products, not because of what they are. In fact, they don't even make the best phones. Many people will tell you that Android products are 10 times better. But the people who own Apples own them because of what Apple believes in. You know, here at Apple, we believe in waking up every day and being creative and ingenuitive, if that's even a word. We want to be on the edge of development. We want people to feel a certain way when they use our products. We just happen to make phones. We just happen to make computers. If Apple decided to make something, if Apple decided to make a pair of shoes, people in the Mac family would buy a pair of shoes because of what they believe in. Okay? You start with your why, you understand your purpose, and you quickly change from manipulating people to work with you, and next thing you know, you're inspiring them to work with you. Become an educator who persuades. Anybody um, remember a favorite teacher or professor in high school or college? Yes. Or, a, or an awful teacher or professor in high school or college? Oh yeah. Give me I want one example of each. Cameron, give me give me give me one. Of, either pick the good or the bad. Okay. Uh, great high school or teacher. Great high school English teacher, why? <clears throat> he pushed you, challenged you, he put more work than you thought you could do, and he brought you through to getting it completed. Okay, he tell, stretched you. tell me exactly how, um, <coughs> what, did, what did he do in class that you appreciated? He gave voice, and then he asked really good questions. Okay, give me the negative. Grade three teacher. Okay. She um, made people feel stupid and actually called people stupid if they couldn't do problems on the board. And there was a girl that we found out years and years and years later that was dyslexic. And she just made that girl's life hell. Wow. The whole year. Okay. That's another topic. <laughs> from, what, from what I'm delving into, but. I think I can relate to very similar to the situation. But the best teacher was also the worst teacher for me. Hmm. She was the worst teacher because she would call you bluff. She won't settle for anything. One minute past eight, if you're not in the class sitting down, yeah. you're going to detention. <laughs> you're going to the principal's office. <coughs> okay. But the other thing is that, Paul Cameron can relate this one too, because when the teacher comes and sees you, she's, she knows you're slacking off, but she doesn't say you're slacking off. Is I know you can do better, Sue. And the way that she says it, say, like, you're capable of much more. Yeah. And that's how she inspires. And okay. even though we hate her, we love her. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let me, let me. I'll give you uh, two two quick personal stories yeah. um, <laughs> of of the difference between what I would say is a person who's um, an educator and a person who learns to be a persuader. And I'm not saying, I'm not going to say that either is better or we need a balance of both, but let me give you a quick example. The person who is, only knows how to educate, here's my memory of it. You're sitting in a class, the class is loaded with content and stats and materials, and I mean, you're pounding through books, but that's all it is. And the educator, the person who's, whose sole purpose is to educate, what do, they, what do they do most often and best? They provide information. But they can cause their audience to freeze. Because many times, it's just overwhelming. I mean, we've all probably been there before, where you're in this, you're in this class. I mean, I remember from university. I mean, the, the guy's voice is monotone. He's probably smarter than 10 of me put together. But it's literally just this long stream of information. And that's it. Just giving me information. And what do I do with that? I go, I don't even know what to do with that. But the persuader causes us to act, or causes us to think. And a person who's only a persuader 
can actually make us a little nervous as well. And maybe a good example of that is a car salesman, mm -hmm. right? You know, you show up in the lot, there's, there's very little information, very little education, but you can tell very, very quickly that this guy's goal is to persuade you into buying a car today. So we've got to have a balance of both. We've got to have the ability to provide the necessary facts, the important information, but then you've got to have the ability to persuade. Here's a um, here's a here's an example of what I would say is my 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 favorite teacher in school. Grade eleven English. Um, we would hit Shakespeare, and rather than just you know reading through the book together or anything like that, I mean, which which I've done in every other class, the guy would literally climb up on the table and read as if you know Mark Anthony is standing in front of us. Hmm. And, you know, he gave us all the important facts, but then he then went as far as saying, so here's the information, and here's my view on the information. Here's how I see it. And he draws you into his mind and how he views the world. And then, you know, the best persuaders tell you how you should interpret that information based on whether it be some of their intentions or what your needs are, right? So I mean, imagine yourself in this scenario with, 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 with your clients. You know, you're providing them with the pertinent information, the important facts, but then you've got to be the persuader. How are you the persuader? You're going to say, guys, here's how I interpret this. Here's what I think. Here's my recommendations based on X, Y, Z. If we only provide information and facts, not only can we bore people, but we can actually freeze them because they can become overwhelming and they don't know what to do with them unless we tell them what to do with them. So here should be your goal. Use clear narratives. Specific examples relevant information and learn to lead people with recommendations based on their needs. Clear narratives, specific examples, only relevant information and learn to lead people with recommendations based on their needs. Now, um, question from our industry. So yeah. you're dealing with a client who their need is that they need a larger house because they're having more kids and, and they need the extra space. Yeah. But they've sunk a boatload of money into the place, and so they are also very, very determined that we will not sell below X price. But in all likelihood, it needs to be below that price to uh, to get it to move. So how do you respect that, that they need X price or want X price, but to still try and persuade based on their need for their family without coming across that you don't care if they lose money? Okay, so is the client telling you that they they won't sell below a certain number, or they're yeah, saying we basically, yeah. You know that that is a that's a scenario that you know you probably <coughs> every scenario needs its own you know to, to just give a blanket answer yeah. probably doesn't do it justice. But, but just in general, to be respectful of people's price things and be trying to persuade based on their emotional needs without coming across that you're trying to underhand them or yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. So um, we're, I'll jump ahead a little bit because we're going to talk about that slightly, but I, I'll speak to it now and we'll hit it again later. Um, 
you don't necessarily have everybody on the same page all the time, right? And this is what you're saying. You know, you're communicating one thing, and your audience, or part of your audience, can actually be at odds with what you're saying. And I mean, if we just draw back to the video, Barack Obama had just won an election, but really the country was split. And so sometimes you're in a meeting, you've got you know, what I would call, or refer to that as is opposition. And one of the best things you can do with opposition, first of all, is I call it recognize the elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. um, but then part of that is validating it. And so, you know, it might it might go something like this. Like if you know if we throw some numbers to it, you know, and, and you know, you you think the home is worth four hundred and fifty thousand dollars or thereabouts, and they can only do it for four seventy. You know, part of that process again, it doesn't it doesn't solve the issue. It doesn't provide the answers. But just looking at, at your folks and saying, hey guys, you know, I understand what you're saying. You know, I understand your situation, and I understand, you know, your financial situations and what your goals are. Those all make perfect sense to me. Now, I have a couple different jobs I have to play for you here. I have to be your agent, but I've also got to be your advisor. And one of the ways I advise you is I need to have a clear understanding of the market statistics, what's going on, comparable data, and then I've got to bring my recommendations to you based on the science, right? Because some of what you're talking to me about is, is the emotion of the situation, right? It's your family's needs. It's things that aren't based necessarily on facts and figures. And so, guys, what I'm telling you today is, you know, based on facts and figures and the science, here's what I see being achievable. You know, and, and, I, and I, what I'm hearing us come to the conclusion of is that those two things aren't lining up. And, and it's not necessarily a bad thing to look at them and say, you know what, I don't have the answer to this. You know, I'm not sure that I can that I can rectify for this, this this for you today. And it may be that, you know, we have to alter our goals a little bit. But just by validating, you know, where they're at and, and almost repeating it back to them and speaking it out, that can because you know when, when when there's opposition in the room I'm jumping ahead a little bit now, but when, when there's opposition in the room, one of the worst things we can do is not acknowledge it right away. Because I can guarantee you this, if you haven't acknowledged it, and you haven't talked about it, whatever you're talking about, well, isn't getting listened to. Because that is the most important thing in that moment, right? And uh, many times it comes in the form of what? Money, right? There's some type of a money issue. It can also, the other one that, that I find is significant in, in our industry, in all industries represented here, is can be parents. You know, particularly with first time buyers or, or you know, people, not necessarily the first time buyer, but maybe, maybe the parents are a part of the process because the kids are getting a loan or leaning on them financially to make something happen. And you know, you're, you're walking, you can feel it, right? You're walking people through a process and then all of a sudden you're going, geez, I've got some opposition here. And, it's so important to address that now, because one of the, I mean, you, what, you don't want to get down the road and find out that this opposition is a deal killer, and now you've wasted your time. Or more often than not, it's not that the opposition is a deal killer, but you need to validate it, validate it, and acknowledge it, and and make that person or those people feel like their opinions and the way they feel are important. Then, rather than walking ahead of them, going alone down the road, you're coming around them, you're you know, figuratively speaking, putting your arm around them and you're walking with them together. And part of that validation process is looking at them and saying, hey, what do you think? If you were in my shoes, what would you do here, mom and dad? How would you recommend, you know, your kids move forward? Because I'm with you, mom and dad. I want your kids to be in the best position possible and I want them to get five, ten years down the road and feel like they made a great decision here. Does that answer it a little bit? Yeah. We totally jumped ahead to something, but that's fine. <laughs> Sorry. Can I throw a comment? Yeah. Uh, one of the things in that question that Matt's asking is um, it, it's, it, it's really tough to answer the facts. You know, because the facts are the facts. I mean, you paid, you know, they put the facts are the facts. You can't change the facts. And uh, when you can't change the facts, the only question now is if we didn't move ahead with this, is there some future loss? See, a lot of times, I give you an example, um, private school, people will say, I can't afford to send my kids to that school. 
I've always said, can you afford not to? The facts are the facts. It, it's it's going to cost you as much money to send the kids to school. The only question is, can you afford not to? Same with the house, same with the break in the mortgage. Like a lot of times we'll break a mortgage. I'm not a mortgage broker, I help you guys help me, but I show people, I sell mortgages all day. I show people how to break the mortgage and pay the penalty for what they're going to gain in the next 10, 15 years. So in that moment, Matt, that you're talking to, or speaking about, um, hopefully, by the time you've gotten to that place, you've discovered the reasons why your clients are wanting to make the move in the first place. And you know, sometimes it can be tough to get to the real reasons, right? You know, you're gonna you gotta peel back the layers of the onion to find out. But it's in that moment, you know, now now Ray's great gave a great example there where you know you can't answer the facts, but you draw the client's attention to the future, the goal. And you know, maybe it was kids. Maybe it's sometimes it's, it's proximity to family. Sometimes it's financial, right? They they've got to get out of the the burden of a four hundred thousand dollar mortgage and get into a home where they have a two hundred fifty thousand dollar mortgage. And so you can't alter the facts. You draw their attention back to what the original purpose was, and then you put it back on them and you say, guys, I understand what you're saying. This is difficult stuff. But can you afford not to achieve the goal that you shared with me? Can you afford not to get into that place? You know, based on what I heard you say, based on the emotion that I saw in your eyes two weeks ago that I, when I met with you, I mean, I think that's pretty important to you. So, I mean, I want to help you get to that place because, you know, the way you communicated that to me, that sounds like it was the most important thing in your life today. We've got a few obstacles. We'll do the best we can to, to, to maneuver through and get through those and, and manage those obstacles. Um, but, you know, we can't change the facts, unfortunately. Draw their attention ahead to their goals. And that goal was to get into a bigger place because they had another kid coming on the way or something. That's what he said. Yep. So, you know, you try to focus their attention on yep. if they don't suffer the 20,000 loss now. Yeah. Because you get the I'm just using your number. Yeah. It means that they are, they are putting a value of $20,000 on it as being equal to the stress of continuing to live in a small place, yeah. uh, having a baby in a smaller house, and yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You know? let, let me say this too. Part of, part of our, our jobs, part of what we do, if we're doing our job properly, sometimes we're going to talk people out of doing what they originally thought they were going to do. Mm. You know? Any, anybody can, can when, when confronted with an opportunity to make money, can talk a client into doing something, right? Or manipulate the circumstances and su circumstances in such a way that you know you you hope you've positioned yourself best to make a commission. But there are scenarios where you know what you learn the facts, you find out everything that's going on, and you look at a client, and you go, you know what, guys, based on what you've told me, I mean, tell me if I'm wrong here, but it may be better that you stay put for a little while, or don't do this, or you know, don't switch up your mortgage. You know, it's in that moment that you really have the ability to actually earn a lot of respect. I mean, you, you go from just the salesperson looking to make another deal to, you know, the trusted advisor who's actually looking out for the best interest of the client. I just had that scenario two weeks ago. Um, you know, I won't drop locations or names or anything like that to, to not breach confidentiality, but, you know, a client wanted to move from point A to point B. Um, prices were quite different for the same product from point A to point B. Um, they bought the home at a time when the market was much higher. And I mean, you know, I, I provided with them with the cold, hard facts. They analyzed what they were going to be able to do if they moved to this other location. And I saw how much strain it was going to put on their financial life to accomplish this. And you know, when I sat in their living room and then just, you know, heard everything that needed to happen, um, they said, Andrew, you know, what do you think? And my answer was something like this. I said, you know, I, I don't really know. I'm hearing what you guys are saying. I'm hearing the sacrifices you're having to make. I'm also hearing that, you know, it's, it's not imminent that you have to leave this place today. And I question whether or not it's worth it because of all the other sacrifices you're going to have to make to get to that other spot. And, you know, a few days later, I got an email and a call that said, hey, you know, Andrew, we really appreciate your advice. We appreciate your honesty. We're going to stay put for probably another couple of years until this makes more sense. 
you know, sometimes you talk people out of it. But when they're ready, they won't be calling anybody else. Well, that's right. I mean, they, 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 I mean part of the, the rest of the communication was, wow, you know, we've never talked to anybody like that. We're really impressed that you, you know, are looking out for our best interest. And, you know, two years from now, you're the guy. You know, so I mean, it's, a, it's there's rewards that come with uh, with uh, having the, the courage to do that, right? Flip over your page. Become a good storyteller. Everybody needs their go-to stories. Write that down for yourself. I must have my go-to stories. Now, I already told the story of my grade 11 English teacher. Um, this guy was an incredible five minutes. Wow, time travels fast. Break. Coffee. Okay. This guy was an incredible storyteller. I mean, he would literally, we'd, we'd walk in. We're grade 11, right? 16-year-old kids. We're more concerned about lunchtime, <laughs> girls, guys, and, and, and when we're going home. He'd jump up onto his table, and I mean, he would literally act out the class. And what happened? People were engaged instantly. They were, boom, drawn in. 16-year-olds drawn in. Imagine that. 16-year-olds hmm. yeah. usually like herding cats. <laughs> so here's a story that I use. Um, and this is, I mean, this is a, this, you're going to think the story is ridiculous. But I will tell you that I have told this story probably between 25 and 35 times. And I'll use it in a scenario where I'm, I'm out with buyers. Um, generally speaking, like, you know, probably one of the first times or second times. And we're not quite on that level where, like, you know, we're tight. Um, you know, they, they, they're, you know, so it's usually the first time out, maybe a few homes in. And I'm wanting to loosen up, loosen them up, right? Because it can be, can be kind of, you know, tense going into the homes, especially for first timers or you know maybe maybe there's something going on at home or maybe they've got the kids along with them and it's just kind of a pain to get them out of the car and into the car and that kind of thing so here's a story I tell we'll walk into a home and uh, you know I, this is like so common but you'll get these signs on the houses or you get the message from the realtor don't let the cat out you know when you show the home just do not let the cat out of the house I'm thinking like why can't the freaking cat go outside like, what, you know, <laughs> apparently I guess cats get eaten yeah. But um, you know, we'll walk in and I'll and I'll say I'll say to the folks, hey folks, you know, we, we can't we can't let this cat out. I don't know what this cat is or what it's like, but it can't get outside. We get inside and we go, man. And I'll look at them and I'll say, you know, I killed a cat once. <laughs> and they look at me and they go, what? Yeah, honestly, I killed a cat. A few years back, I'm uh, I'm I'm showing a home just like this, and and you know, sign on the door, instructions from realtors, don't let the cat out. It's a BC box, one of those bi-level entries. St you walk in, tight entry, stairs up, stairs down. You know, I literally go like undercover. I crack the door open, step in. No cat, no cat, great. The door's open, people are walking in, and right as they're walking in, I see this cat, two beady eyes, crunched down between the railings of the upper level, and it is literally ready to make a jump on the outdoors. And as it pushes <laughs> off from the edge to fly outside, I lunge towards the door to get it closed. <laughs> Crunch. Oh, no. Cat's head, neck, in oh. the door. Oh. Total true story. So, like, think about it. I'm showing houses, right? I mean, like, we're, I'm a professional realtor, you know? And I'm telling people that I just crushed the skull of a cat. And you go, why are you telling this? This is crazy. It I don't know. It's one of now. it's one of my it's one of my go-to stories. It loosens up the cat. They go, you can't you kill a cat? Yeah, I killed a cat. Well, what happened? Well, you know, I looked for the cat. Number one, couldn't find it. Thing jumped up, ran around in the home, and and you know, I don't know where it went. And you know, I had to go through the process of calling the realtor and calling the people. And like, I mean, how do you communicate that, right? So here's the deal. Uh, you know, and then you know. I, I didn't think this was probably dumb, but I actually offered it and I'll buy you a new cat. Oh! I don't, and you know, they, they didn't want a new cat. But I mean, that go-to story, as crazy as that sounds, and I've got, I mean, I've got loads. Yeah. you got to have these things it in your bag <laughs> that you can pull out at various times when the time is right. Right? I've got, I've got stories that have to do 
you know, with, with lots of them that actually have to do with, you know, different scenarios of whether you're working with buyers or sellers. Um, some of them have nothing to do with real estate at all, but these are stories that you're just going to draw upon as you're reading the mood and you're gauging what's going on. You're going to pull those things out and you've told them over and over. You're really good at it. You change them up every now and then. Maybe they get exaggerated from time to time. And, but these, these are used for what purpose? You, your job is to make people comfortable, right? They're, they're making a big decision, and you can't have them distracted by things that they shouldn't be distracted by. So what you're trying to do, you want to bring them back down to the level where they're most comfortable so that they can do what they need to do best. And in that moment, it was, you know, it's, I want them relaxed as they're going through the home. I want them thinking, this Andrew, he's, he's a real guy, right? I'm not, I'm not some, you know, stiff realtor trying to, trying to pressure them into anything. And it just, it, it takes it down a level and brings it to a level that everybody can be more relaxed. Let's do one, one more before we break. Personal anecdotes. So these are slightly different than our stories. Um, and just as with stories, everybody needs their go-to personal anecdotes. Now, a story doesn't necessarily have to be about you. The one that I just shared that I use is about me. But I mean, I've told, I'll have go-to stories that are about my sister or about my parents or about somebody that I don't even know. But a personal anecdote is exactly that. It is a personal anecdote. These are used, you might, let's write this down, used to support your intention, but must not become the focus or distract from the intention. So we talked about intention a few minutes ago first, and we said, you know, your, your, your focus is your intention. Okay, so these personal anecdotes are used to support your intention, but must not distract from your intention. So I'm going to give you examples of what these might look like. Um, a childhood event that was a catalyst in your life. A uh, setback or disappointment that turned out to be a positive outcome. A life changing event and how it influenced you. My personal favorite, recalling what your parents wanted you to become and how that's influenced you. I like that one because in these significant situations in life, many, many times parents have a voice in what's going on or a family member let's not even say parents let's say a family member who's outside the situation has a voice and oftentimes the decisions we make which are the right decisions for our family or for whatever we're doing are going to equal disappointment to a family member or disappointment to you know a parent and so these anecdotes can be used at strategic times when you know a person's on the verge of making a decision and they know they're about to bring disappointment to someone in their life or, you know, it's not what somebody necessarily agrees with me. So you can say, hey, you know what? I know what you're talking about. I can identify with you. When I was this old or when I bought this home or when I was this age, my parents forced me to do this, become this, listen to this, do it this way. And you know what? It was brutal. In fact, it got to a point where it caused some strain in the relationship for a period of time. But, thankfully, we got through that. I made the necessary decisions I needed to. And now my parents have come around. They see how that was the best thing for me. And we've got a fantastic relationship today. And in fact, we joke about it amongst ourselves today. And we look back at it and say, geez, how could we have been so, you know, dumb in the moment? Having those personal, and these, these personal anecdotes, just like your stories, 
they're, they're in your brain already. You use them over and over and over again, and you're drawing upon them and pulling them out at key points when the situation is right to help what? Bring calm to a situation, take it down a notch, take people off the ledge, and help them think clearly and relax in what can be difficult moments. Make sense? Okay, quick break. Okay, so we finished off with, um, we're on fundamentals of communication still. We've just finished personal, personal anecdotes. Let's go to be physical. Now, quick caution and disclaimer. Be appropriate and use caution. <laughs> but that being said, Be comfortable touching people. A huge part of communication is what we do with our bodies, right? I'm standing here in front of you today, I'm talking, I'm hopefully to some degree using my hands appropriately, I'm, you know, my voice is alter altering, I'm stepping in different positions. But the, but the next piece of that, which you, know, you, you don't necessarily do with an audience, but you do it when you're one-on-one -on -one or in smaller groups, is at appropriate times, it's really important to touch people. Whether it be a handshake, a hand on the shoulder, even a hug. Because we, you know, I'll say it this way, we shake hands because it's expected and we have to, but we hug or we, you know, properly place an arm because we care about a person. I'll give you that in a sentence so you can write it down. You shake a person's hand because it's expected. But a well-placed hand on the shoulder, or a hug, is because you care. Now, I'm not trying to get bushy on you, but let me give you, uh, let me give you a, a, another real-life example here. So, um, I'm recently in a situation where um, there's, there's a husband and a wife and they're, they're selling their home. And this is uh, a traumatic experience, not because their home isn't saleable, or not because, you know, I, I honestly think it's going to sell quite well, but they had such an awful experience the last time around. You know, I wasn't involved in that process, but they listed their home, and it was just, it was horrible, you know, things didn't go well. There was, there was like, I, I just heard negative story after negative story of, the, of what went on in that scenario, and ultimately they sat on the market for a long time and they didn't sell. So, you know, part of the process of me helping them get prepared is, I mean, I, I read them the Riot Act. I mean, they've, they've got young children, and I mean, I've got young children, so I mean, I can identify with them, right? I used my stories, I used my anecdotes, but I said, guys, here's the deal. We can't have a dining room looking like a toy room. We can't have a beautiful, great room like you have looking <coughs> like a TV room that has Dora on all day. We need to turn your home into a show home. So I gave them a list. Like, I mean, I actually felt bad with the size of the list. They hired a contractor. They bought new furniture. They bought a new dining room suite because I was going to be moving them. I said, listen, do you ever plan on getting a dining room suite? Yeah, we do. We love one. Great. Go buy one. And go buy a really, really nice one. And you're going to take that with you to your next home. Yeah. And this, this, all the money that we spend here is going to help us not only get more money, it's not only about increasing value, it's about increasing saleability. And they got that because they weren't saleable the last time, right? Wow. And it didn't work out the last time. So I walk them through that process, they do it all, and I, I gotta say, I am shocked. It's rare that, you know, uh, <laughs> a person who's selling a home will do everything that you tell them to do. And these guys did. It was unbelievable. And so there's this moment where I'm I'm in the, the entryway of their home, and uh, and you know I can I can still see the anxiety on this woman's face. I mean she is really nervous and how this is going to go and how her showing is going to happen and are we going to be able to work around nap time because if my son doesn't get his nap things are a mess. Like I mean these are real life issues to a mom, right? I know I'm married to a mom. <laughs> 
And there's a moment where, I, I mean, I, I'm thinking, I, I'm like, oh my God, like, I'm not going to use her real name, but let's pretend her name is Sharon. Like, I'm thinking, I, I could just hug this woman. Like, she literally just needs a hug. So, did I give her a full hug? No. What I did is I looked at her and I said, Sharon, you've done an amazing job. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Literally, so I did. Thank you for all the work and effort that you've put in. When your home sells, and it will, you're going to get to take credit for some of that because of what you did. And I appreciate that. And I mean, I had my hands on her shoulders and I meant it. And instantly, like, you know, just, just that, that touch, that personal touch, I'm not saying it solved all the problems. Did she still lie awake that night? Probably. But I had an opportunity where I could show her my level of care, right? And my level of care was high. And, uh, and I mean, all I can say is that, you know, there's, there's moments like that where you have those opportunities. And, you know, sometimes in our culture, we're, we're hesitant, and I get it. I mean, it, you know, it can be a touchy thing, no pun intended, to, uh, to, to touch someone. But people respond well to appropriate touch. And it communicates something that you can't communicate with words. And so, you know, look for those opportunities and, um, and use them appropriately. One quick note on that, which has nothing to do with that topic. Um, those people, you know, you, you'll have scenarios where, where clients, hopefully, where clients do what you ask them to do and they do what they're told. you got to reward them for that. And so um, the next day, she got a beautiful bouquet of flowers um, delivered to her door. And it said something like this. It said, you know, Sharon, um, my job isn't always easy in markets like this, but people like you make my job much easier. Easier. Thanks for doing what I asked and putting such a great effort in into getting your home ready. And I mean, doing something, 20 bucks, $25, what does that do? I mean, that sets the stage for the relationship. It set, and you know, if we have rocky times from that point forward, if we do sit on the market for a while, if kids do miss nap times and things get hairy at home, that little flower, or those little packages of flowers are going to be remembered for a long time, and it just sets the stage for, the, you know, for a long, healthy, prosperous relationship. <laughs> Reward your clients when they listen to you. Flip your page. Never begin with an apology. Well, I've never sold one of these, but, or, <laughs> forgive me, folks, but I'm, I'm a little nervous tonight. <coughs> I've, I've only actually been doing this a few months, but I'll try. This is a good one. Sorry, I, I meant to bring the paperwork. I'll just, I guess I'll run back to my office and I'll get it. These are all common apologies that people will use, you know, in the monster industry. I use them myself. I hear them all the time. All I can say is weak. Weak, weak, weak. Yes, you make mistakes. Yes, you don't always have all the answers. But conveying that to your client does not set them up to respect you. Here's the, here's, the, here's the common rationale that goes into, in, into that moment and why a person would use an apology. We think subconsciously, you know, lower the expectations by using the apology. So whether it was, I was late, or I haven't done this before, or I'm nervous now, or whatever, we're lowering the expectations by saying, sorry, but then when we perform, at a me mediocre standard, the client will actually be impressed because the expectations were lowered to begin with. That's what's happening subconsciously when we make an apology. You get that? Does that make sense? But what happens? An audience who pities you rarely respects you. An audience who pities you rarely respects you.
Learn to own your mistakes. And, you know, make, sometimes you make a mistake, make it part of your intention. You know, and certainly don't draw attention to it in a moment when you're trying to communicate. So, you know, a common, number one, I mean, a common thing, <coughs> we're running between appointments and, you know, you can be late, right? Well, if you know you're going to be late, the call can happen before the moment, right? So your appointment's at noon. And you're looking at your clock and you're going, geez, I'm only going to get there at 12.10. Well, there's nothing wrong with a call that goes something like this. It's 10 minutes to noon. Hey, Brian, it's Andrew. Hey, I'm on my way. I'm, uh, I'm making my way from another appointment. It looks like I'm going to land about 5, 10 minutes late. But I'll see you really soon. Oh, okay, no problem. Now, when you show up, you're actually not late. You called and changed the appointment. Mm -hmm. But to just show up, flustered, sweating, nervous... Hey, sorry I'm, sorry I'm late. What have you done? You're subconsciously, you're lowering the expectations, hoping that, you know, you're going to be able to come around and surprise them with, you know, what's going to be a better performance. But most often, an audience that pities you rarely respects you. So, I mean, the moral of the story is be prepared and, and don't, don't make mistakes. But we all know that that, you know, that doesn't happen, right? So, you know, there's other scenarios where, yeah, you're thinking in your head, shoot, I had it done it this way, or I wish I had it done this. But you're not going to communicate that to your client. Everything you do is intentional. It was all part of your plan. And there's ways to work around that and communicate in such a way where your client per perceives that this is actually what you wanted to do, and this is what you intentioned. Question? So... One of the things, that I'd, I'd like to get your feedback on this, one of the things when I know I'm lining up two or three appointments, and there's going to be, say, 20 minutes between them, and I know I'm about a 15-minute drive, I'll say, yeah. I do have clients before you, yeah. and I want you to know that I'm going to take the time that I need with them to make sure that all their questions are answered. So I might mm -hmm. be a few minutes late, yeah. but if I am, I guarantee you will get the same time to get all your questions answered, just yeah. like the client before. Yeah. And I think I liken that to the doctor's office. If you're really sick and the doctor needs to spend 20 minutes with you, whereas the next person they're just going to, you know, you got a flu, here's a prescription, I'll see you later. Yeah. Then, I mean, that is my thinking. What's your feedback on that? Well, you know, I, when it comes to the timing thing, I'll, I'll tell you this, um, I had to, I had to reteach my brain this, but I rarely make appointments. I rarely say to you, hey Matt, I'll meet you at 11 a.m. So I've got three appointments in a day. I had a great example of this yesterday, actually. I'm, showing properties out in Surrey, and I had a fall, I make a following appointment in Brookswood. And it's like late afternoon, I know traffic's gonna be crazy, right? Well, the appointment I make, you know, the conversation goes something like this. Person says, hey, can we meet, set, or uh, what was it yesterday, Thursday afternoon? Yeah, absolutely, what time would you like to meet? Well, late after, you know, late afternoon. Hey, that works for me, but I'll tell you what, th this is what's going on in my schedule. I've got this and this happening in this location at this time. I can probably land at that appointment between 4 and 4.20. Does that work for your schedule? Yeah, yeah, that would work. And I'll tell you what, when I'm leaving my other appointment, I'll text you or I'll call you and give you my ETA. And I mean, that might, you know, I, I think there's a, there's, a, there's a mindset or a, so, I don't know, there's a teaching out there. I mean, I, I was taught this too, like, you know, you have a listing appointment, you know, Tell the people you're going to be there at 11 a.m. and you better not show up a minute late. Well, I mean, I get these appointments and I, I just, I'm honest with people. Hey, guys, you want to meet in the late morning? That's awesome. Uh, I'm going to be coming from another appointment that starts at 9. It's on the other side of town. So I'm, I'll be at your home between 11 and 11.20. Does that work? Oh, yeah, that works great. We'll, we'll be home all morning. Would you like me to call you when I'm 15 minutes ahead or away? Yeah, yeah, we'd appreciate that. Awesome. Great. And so I make soft times. And then I'm using the call ahead so that, you know, people like to know when's Andrew going to walk to the door. Maybe they're putting a pot of coffee on, maybe they're putting the kid down to nap or whatever. You know, you're, you're, you're adding a step to buy yourself grace in your timing. And then what happens? You've, you're never making an apology about your time because you haven't committed yourself to something that you, you know is likely not going to happen. Managing, managing expectations. I have, exactly. another, I have another question for apology. 
Yep. Is an apology appropriate in, say, a, a couple times I've had the situation where I'm coming for a listening presentation and the, the price is way below they were listed before or what they were saying, and I'm basically saying, like, I'm sorry, I know this isn't the message that you want to hear, but my job isn't to tell you what you want, it's to tell you basically what the market is saying. Is yeah. an apology appropriate in that situation? Well, in that situation, you didn't actually make a mistake. Okay, so you're, it's, you're, it's not apologize. Uh, the, the, the concern with apology then is apologizing for a mistake, not apologizing, period. In, in these, some of these examples I cited, what it, wh why we have to ask ourselves, why is the person opening with an apology? Mm -hmm. Well, what I say is subconsciously what's going on is they are, you know, the, the, the thought process is I lower the expectations mm -hmm. of the apology. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe sometimes we blame other people. Oh, you know, I'm sorry, my, my assistant didn't get this paperwork together for me. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, don't, so I don't have it here on me. Or, you know, we'll, we'll place blame wherever we can, except yeah. on ourselves, yeah. right? Yeah. You're lowering the expectations in hopes that, you know, when you hit the ball, or when you do the mediocre to better job, because you've lowered the expectations to begin with, the people are going to be thoroughly impressed. You look like a rock star. Right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But what happens? Well, people who pity you rarely respect you. Okay. That scenario that you're explaining, I mean, I've apologized to people in that situation. Yeah. It's like literally sometimes it's like, guys, I, I, I'm sorry. Um, I, I know this is really difficult to hear, mm -hmm. but these are the facts. Yeah. And as far as I can tell, I'm sitting at your table today because you wanted to hear the facts. Mm -hmm. So here's the facts. And I'm sorry if it's offensive. I'm sorry if it, if it blindsides you. I'm sorry if it means that what your goals are now have to change. Mm -hmm. But trust me, this is the information you need. Yeah. So the apology isn't the isn't like an apology itself isn't the weakness. It's the context for the apology. Yeah, I'm giving, the exactly. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. There's scenarios where we have to apologize. And you know what? There's scenarios where you legitimately make a mistake. Mm -hmm. And then what do you need to do? Oh. Own the apology. Mm -hmm. Say, hey, you know what? I'm sorry. I screwed up. Mm -hmm. Done. Mm -hmm. Not I screwed up, but mm -hmm. you know, it's just I screwed up. Mm -hmm. And and I don't even you know like I mean. There's scenario. Some people would say, "Hey, I screwed up, and it won't happen again." Bullshit. <laughs> it might happen again, yeah. right? Just own the apology. Be sincere. People appreciate that. Okay, we jumped ahead a little bit before, but let's let's talk about the elephant in the room again. <coughs> we talked about um, acknowledging the opposition. Can we play the second part of that video? So to watch another quick video clip here. far more divided than ours. We are not enemies, but friends. <laughs> Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. To those Americans who, whose support I have yet to earn, as Lincoln said to a nation far more divided than ours, we are not enemies, but friends. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. To those Americans who, whose support I have yet to earn, I may not have won your vote tonight, but I hear your voices, I need your help, and I will be your president too. <laughs> And all those watching tonight from beyond our shores, from parliaments and palaces, those who are... Brilliant. Yeah. Absolutely brilliant. Acknowledge your opposition and validate it. Half the country didn't want this guy in power. Mm -hmm. Do we have lights back on? What did he say? I hear your voices. And I will be your president too. So, if you sense there is an elephant in the room, and the two examples that I used earlier were sometimes it comes in the form of money, it can also come in the form of family or parents, 
drag that thing's ass up on the table and stick it there until you flushed it out. Because anything you're this what I didn't tell you is this is actually much earlier in his speech. So the, the first section that we watched, that was that was like the last three and a half minutes. This is way earlier in the talk. He's acknowledging and validating his opposition in the country before he gets into the rest of the meat of his presentation. Why? Because if he doesn't, they're sitting there the whole time going, I hate this guy, I can't stand mm -hmm. this guy. Okay, great, we got friggin' left wing democratic government, you know, my business is going, you know, blah blah, whatever. Whatever anyone's thinking, that's what's in their mind. But the moment he validates them and says, I hear your voice, I want to partner with you. I will be your president too. Maybe not all, but some suddenly went, huh? And all of a sudden, he's got them, right? So we're in those situations too. We know there's an elephant in the room. No point in talking about anything else until you drag that thing up on the table, smack it in the middle, right in the middle of the room and say, we need to talk about this. Sometimes it's just a matter of validating the opposition. You know, maybe it's the mom and dad, maybe it's a family member. Sometimes you can't get around it, right? And, and a, a prime example of that is money. Whether they can't afford to sell, as Matt had indicated in, in, in a specific scenario, or maybe it comes down to price, like, you know, commission. They don't want to pay you X amount of dollars. Maybe they've, you know, they've talked to other people who, who will do it for less. Get that on the table today. Because one of two things is either going to happen, is what is going to happen. You're either going to be able to talk through it and work around it. And, I'll, and I'll, let me say this. If that is the elephant, that is a beautiful scenario and transition to be able to go into a talk and discuss price versus value. Sometimes that can be a, a, a challenging topic to get into in an appointment where you're needing to discuss that with a client. If the elephant's there, throw it up on the table and you're either going to work through it or the thing's going to take a dump in the middle of the table and you know that you're, you're done, right? I mean, you, 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 but better to get it out now than to get another 45 minutes into your time or an hour into your time or another two, three days into your time and then you find out you're not getting rid of this elephant and now you've just wasted more of your time. Hit it early, validate it, partner with it, and most often, you can move forward with it. Can we hear an example of you overcoming a commission objection? Absolutely. So here's oftentimes what happens in the commission conversation. You are, let, let's just throw some numbers to it. Cameron, you cost uh, $20,000, and the reason there's an objection, more often than not, is because they've talked to somebody else, or they have a, they have a thought or a concept of what you know somebody else may cost, right? Very, you know, that's really what what creates the objections. There's, you know, it's no different than, you know, anything else we buy in life. You know, we think we can get the same product for X, so why would we pay Y, right? The first I should say it first, one of the most important steps in that process is what I call establish the gap. So here's, here's oftentimes how that language can go. People go, you, you want us to pay $20,000 for you to sell our home? Well, no, that's actually not what I'm asking you to pay. Really? Well, that's what I hear you saying. Well, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, if I'm, if I'm understanding you correct, this other individual you talk to, these other people you talk to, you know, they're, they're going to charge you, you know, roughly sixteen, seventeen thousand dollars. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so I'm not asking you to pay me twenty. I'm asking you to pay me three. You've already committed to paying seventeen, right? It's not a question of whether you pay twenty or zero. You are going to pay money, and I just, I mean, I, I used this not that long ago. Um, the gap was probably five or six thousand. And I said, here's the, here's the deal, folks. You've spent $15,000. The question is, are you going to spend 20? So the gap is five. And here's what you need to determine. After we spend time together and we go through all of the important facts, you need to be able to look me in the eye and say, you know what? We believe that this guy is worth $5,000. We see the difference in value. We understand that through the negotiation process on our sale, the negotiation process on our purchase, his ability to negotiate, handle other realtors, handle buyers, handle objections, 
and walk us through the trials of selling in today's market, that not only is he going to make up that $5,000, but he's probably going to do more than that. So establish your gap, because the gap is what you're asking them to pay. And, and part of the, the problem is that people are focused on the big number. Mm-hmm. I don't want to just pay, pay you $20,000. You're not paying me 20 because you're already committed to paying somebody else 16 It's four. Do you see enough value for the difference of four? And, you know, in, in many, many cases, maybe not. But if you hone your craft, you work on your value, and you do some of the other things that we've discussed in other weeks and months gone by, then you do land in a situation where you have that conversation, people look at you and say, yeah, I see the value. I understand. I'm willing to do that. I had a scenario. Uh, this is literally within the last month. Um, person that I'm, uh, the, the other individual they're talking to is going to work for maybe $4,500, $5,000 less. And, you know, time comes to sign the paperwork and we actually hadn't, up until that point, we hadn't really talked about talked about numbers that much. We talked about the value of the home, but we hadn't talked about the cost. And the individual looks at the contract and goes, whoa, you know, looks at the number. I want to give numbers when he goes, wow, that's, that's expensive. I said, yeah, you're right, it is. So validate opposition. Yeah, you're right, it is. And he goes, well, is there anything we can do about that? Well, what do you, what do you mean? Well, I don't know, like, you know, such and such, I, I see, the word was, I see these all the time, I know that, that this person would work for this much. Yeah, you're right, he would. I said, but you know, we've spent some time together now. You know how I do business, you know how I operate. You've been able to see me in some situations. If at this point in the game, you can't look at me and say, wow, I see the difference in value, then I probably haven't done my job properly and I should get up and walk away from your table and let you go work with somebody else. Then I went on to say, you know what? Let's say this. I'll put $1,000 on the table right now, and I'll tell you that you can have that $1,000 if that's what you need to move forward with me. But I'll tell you something. That's not what I want to have happen. I don't want us to work together based on that premise. I don't want you to choose me because I've manipulated you with a small bone. So just so you know, the money's there. Why? Because it would probably be poor business practice for me just to turn down X amount of dollars for this little amount. But that's not the way I want us to move forward together. I want you to look me in the eye and say, Andrew, I respect you. I respect the way you do business. I see your value. And I want to pay you your full price because I know that's how we'll move forward best. And that individual looked me in the eyes and said, that makes a lot of sense. He literally slid the paper back and said, where do I sign? (laughs) <laughs> now, that's it. I mean, let's not take that lightly. Not everybody can have that conversation. Okay? Many of you in the room probably maybe are capable of having that type of conversation today. But you can get to that point. There's a lot of things to accomplish and achieve and learn. And, you know, you learn to think a certain way. But, I mean, you get to that point, it's powerful. Very, very powerful. Be a closer. Why do we need to learn to be a closer? Because we retain best the things we hear last. So here's a here's a here's a fatal mistake in our industry. You've gone through your presentation whatever it is you're doing, and you end it with this. Are there any questions? And that, you know, I mean, a lot of people do that. That seems harmless. But now what you've done is you, you know, hopefully to some point along the way, you know, you've had your intent, you've had your purpose, you've been working towards something, and then rather than hitting the home run, eye contact, tone of voice, telling people what you want them to do, you've now backed off, because probably because you've chickened out, or you haven't, you haven't known up until this point that you need, to, you need to close in that moment. And you open it back up again, you go to any questions. And the problem is, is with that ending, you've now allowed the conversation to go any which direction. Any which direction, and you're no longer in lead, and you're not in control. 
So how do we close? We slow down. You use a strong and steady voice. Eye contact. Be dramatic. Got to be passionate. That, that comes back to knowing your why, communicating with the limbic brain. Use powerful stories. We talked about having stories. I've got a collection of stories that I only use in the most important situations when I'm ready to close. Then your call to action. Lead people and tell your audience what you want them to do. So you spent the appropriate amount of time with people, whether it's, you know, whether you're dealing with a buyer or a seller or some other type of client. You spent the time with them, you built a relationship, they have all the facts, the pertinent information, and you know, you know what their goals are. Now's the time to lean in, look at them and say, hey guys, you know what? Based on everything we've done, knowing your goals, it's my recommendation that we do this. And here's why. That's what being a closer is. And if you've done the job properly leading up to that point, the majority of the time, people will do what you ask them to do. If they don't, it's because you probably missed a previous step. OK, flip the page. What are we doing for time here, Ray? 15 minutes? Yeah. Okay. So we'll go quick and then um, I might jump around on you a little bit, but I want to get through some of this. So that was communicating with the client. Now, the negotiation. <clears throat> some of these things that we're going to walk through are, you know, we're talking about literally negotiating transactions. And then sometimes we're talking about, you know, negotiating our own value or our own price. So we're going to flip back and forth in between. Ask for more than you think you can get. Why do you do that? Well, you might just get it. Mm -hmm. It gives room for negotiation. It raises perceived value. So let me speak to that real quickly. Um, now we're in a scenario where, you know, you're you're competing for business, or you know, you're meeting some people, and who knows if you know? Maybe you don't know if you're competing. Um, you know, a common thought in our head is to go, well, geez, I got to pick my price, and you know, I want to make sure that I'm competitive with the market, and they might be talking to this person, and it's so tempting to, you know, quote a number that we think will get us the business based on who we're competing against. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, the best thing you can do in that scenario is quote a number that is dramatically higher than any of your competition. Why? It raises your perceived value. What's the first thing people ask when they go, what, why are those shoes $200 and those ones $100? Mm -hmm. What do we think about the $200 shoes? Something. They're better. Something better. They, there must be something to it that's better than the $100 pair. So does it necessarily mean that, that you're going to land on that price? Well, not always. But you've instantly raised the perceived value value of what it is you're trying to sell, whether that's you or something else. It creates, and again, this is for asking for more than, than you think you can get, you create a climate where the people that you're, you know, you're negotiating against can feel like they achieved a win. You'll oftentimes hear it said, you know, negotiations got to be win-win. And, you know, that, that's a, it's a coin phrase, and, you know, a person could argue it whether or not that's always accurate, but I, I will say this. The key to, a, to winning a negotiation is making the other people feel like they won 
while you still got everything you wanted. And one of the best ways to create that environment is to ask for more than you think you can get. Whether that be price, terms, conditions, dates, whatever. Set yourself up so that, you know, there might be a hill that you're willing to die on, right? Maybe, maybe you're representing a buyer and there's something specific that they just have to have. Number one, you're not going to necessarily reveal that to the other party, at least not right away. But you've got to provide the possibility for all these other victories that the seller can get. Because you know that your, your, your buyer will die on that hill, whether it be dates or a particular price or an included item or whatever. And so as you go through the process, you know, you're going to create the facade or the feeling that as you lose some of those other battles and the seller wins that, you're going to show them that that hurts a little bit and you're bleeding so that they'll allow you to win the battle that's actually most important to you. And you might just get it, right? You never know. Do you have very open conversations with your buyers in a situation? Like, what is the most important thing to you, price or dates? Like, would you say that or just based on what you... I, absolutely. I, I had a scenario. I, I'm telling you all these scenarios in the last few weeks. I had a crazy month. Um, I had a scenario just this last week where um, property is listed for $500,000. Uh, it's worth... Uh, easily for eighty four eighty five. Um, I actually sold it years previous, so I knew I knew the property really well. Buyers prepared to write an offer of like four seventy five. There's no way I was letting them write four seventy five. We wrote four sixty five, and you know a lot of the elements were pointing to like why would we be doing that? It was a brand new listing, only a couple days on the market. Shows really well. You know a lot of I think a lot of people would have brought a different mindset and mentality and said, well, geez, we we can't write a low offer because you know, we're gonna we're gonna piss off the seller. You know, that's mm. common terminology, right? There, it is so important. You can learn to cushion an offer. An offer can be a horrible offer by the way the numbers lie, but you can cushion it. And so that's what we did. We wrote a low offer. We had some unique dates, but I cushioned it. You know, when I bring the offer, I don't I don't go to the I don't present it in such a way and say your home's overpriced. Yeah. And, you know, this is this and that's that, and we think this. I mean, no, I don't want to create opposition. I go to the more open-handed and go, hey guys, this may not be what you were expecting, um, but here's what I know. My clients love your home. It could work for them. We hope it can work for them. Um, and you know, we've come up with the best offer we can based on the facts that we know. And maybe if you've got some other facts that help you see things differently, we'd, we'd love you to share those with us. You know, like th that kind of language, that softer, more open-handed, you know, I don't know everything language, you can get away with offers that you would never be able to get away with if, you're, if you use, you know, firmer, harder, black and white language where you're, you're, you're confrontational, right? So your language there is key. React to proposals. Oh, go ahead. Do you present that one yourself to the seller? I didn't get through to the seller. And you know, some of these questions, we're, we're going to run out of time probably, but we, we'd hit on some of them. Um, you know, that's on the next page, we talk about the higher authority. And but I, let, me, let, me, let me jump to that one in, in a minute. React to proposals. Be expressive. So I'll say this quickly. Uh, counter offers come back. Learn to look at a proposal from somebody, whether you're representing either side, and go, Wow. Wow, that's a counter offer. That's amazing. Geez, that's not what we expected. Why do you do that? You're throwing you're, you're throwing a dart to read the reaction of the other side. And it's amazing what you can learn when you do that. The, the worst thing you can do is not respond. Sometimes people say, oh, you know, the key to negotiating is, you know, being automotive and, and don't show them how you feel. No way. Show them tons of emotion because it's in doing that that you're going to learn more about them. And knowledge is huge. Information is power in a negotiation. Mm -hmm. So I mean, when we, we wrote this offer of, uh, of 465, counter offer comes back. <laughs> I actually thought it was a great counter offer. I think it was something like 492. The guy says, so I got to the counter. It's 492. I go, really? Instantly goes, well, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I, it, it's OK. It's just, you know, we, we were hoping for a little more. And, and I mean, instantly I can feel this like backpedaling on the other side. I mean, I can literally see his mind going, shit, I should have got him 485. I should have got him 485, you know? 
and and it's like you know you just what you learn in doing that is just unbelievable. Mm. Understand the higher authority. Um, very rarely do we get to talk to the actual decision makers, right? Your agent, you're talking to another agent. The authority is the buyer or the seller, right? And I mean, people. If people understand negotiation, I'll tell you, I love to use the higher authority when I'm representing somebody. You know, when, when I'm negotiating, you know, I, it's always great to be able to lean on and say, hey, you know what? That's awesome. I, I hear what you're saying. I'm gonna have to talk to the board. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna have to present that to the seller. I'm gonna have to talk to my wife about that. I can't make a decision before I fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful to be able to use it, right? But when you are up against it, which more often than not you are, there's what the goal should be this. You you can't get let's pretend you can't get to the higher authority, right? You can't get in front of the clients or maybe you I had a scenario where I couldn't get in front of the other spouse. I was dealing with one spouse, he's telling me you know, yeah, yeah, it makes sense to me, but I've got to talk to so-and-so, and, you know, I couldn't get in front of them. Well, the goal should be this. You want to be able to get a verbal reaction, get some kind of verbal commitment out of the person you're talking to that the offer you're presenting and talking about is acceptable to them. Okay, so in many cases, you're, it's the agent, right? And you're hearing the language, yeah, okay, but I need, to, I need to get it to the boss, or I need to get it to these people. And you say, hey, you know what? That makes perfect sense. But let's just talk hypothetical for a second. If you were the decision maker, you know, if you if you were the seller, what well, what do you think of this offer? You know, if this was your home and you were to sell it, or if you decide whether or not to sign this, what do you think? And what have you done? You've now begun to draw out from them what they think, and you want to help bring them to a position where they are committed to what you're presenting. Because then you know at least when they go back to the higher authority. They're using the language and they're, they're, they're saying the things that you want them to say. Make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Acting dumb is smart. Yes, okay, number one, more often than not, you're not the decision maker. So you shouldn't be pretending like you are anyway. And you don't know all the facts because you're not that person. And too often we get drawn into whether it be combative or competitive situations where we, you know, we want to be the person that knows everything. Maybe we're defensive, maybe we're you know, competitive with the other agent. The best thing we can do though is to use language like, geez, I don't know. Or, you know, it makes a lot of sense to me, but, um, but you know, I, I haven't, I haven't got this figured out the way you do. I'll, I'll, I'll talk to my clients to, about that and I'll, and I'll get back to you. Being dumb is actually smart. I love using the line, I don't know. Someone brings you a counter offer and you know, they're, you know, inevitably whether it comes out verbally or there's a look in their eyes and they're saying to you, what, what do you think? You know, do you think this is going to work? Do you think this is going to go? And to look at them and say, geez, I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. And what are you doing? You're, you're putting little seeds of doubt into what they've done. And you know, you're, you're, you're strengthening your position because potentially in their mind, what they're doing in that moment is they're going, oh geez, I'm gonna have to go get more money out of my client. Or I'm gonna have to go get more of this or more of that. And really, you probably do know, but you, the more you don't know, the more you strengthen your position. It's so tempting to respond right in the moment. You never need to respond right in the moment. Buy yourself time, say you don't know, go away. Whether or not you're, you're discussing strategy with your clients or not, maybe you're just thinking, but you're thinking in an environment where you're not at risk of saying something wrong or making the wrong decision. Buy yourself time by being dumb. Come back, represent. Shut up, don't talk first. I love this quote, never interrupt your opponent when he or she is about to make a mistake. <laughs> so here's a quick story again from the last month. Um, multiple offer situation, I'm representing the seller. One offer slightly below asking price, one offer slightly above asking price. 
both are good cash deals, you know, same similar subjects, dates are a little bit different, but common uh, thought in that scenario, particularly in this market, is just, you know, sign the better offer. It's above asking price, you know, why would you screw around with it? And that is actually what the clients are wanting to do. They're saying, Andrew, you know, why would we, why would we do anything but sign this one? I said, well, hold on a second. A couple things. Number one, and this is part of just, you know, doing your job well. I said, guys, I'm actually more, based on what I know about both these buyers, I'm more comfortable with the buyer and the agent with the lower offer. And, and part of what I had to say to them in that moment is I said, let's just pretend for a second this, that we're not multiple and we had this offer on the table. This is a pretty good offer, right? That we, we would be happy with this. Yeah, yeah, you're right, we would. But of course, expectations change when this other higher offer shows up and you know now we think we're going to get more in asking price. So I said, you know, I'm more comfortable with these people. now. These people with the higher offer, we, we, we like their numbers, obviously, but we don't like their dates. So I said, we're going to do two things. We're going to call the higher offer. We're going to say, hey, um, there's a lot of elements, and, and listen to my language here. There's a lot of elements of your offer that we like. You know, it's very similar in some ways to the other offer, but one of the elements that, you know, we can't quite work with is these dates. Hypothetically speaking, if we move forward with you guys, you know, would you be able to do dates something like this? I said, what I want to do is I just want to leave that with you. If you can have a conversation with your clients, get back to me in 10 minutes. I didn't give them a counter offer. I just had a hypothetical conversation. Called the lower offer. These are the guys with the dates we like, but we don't like the price. <laughs> call them up. Hey, hey, it's Andrew. You know, they've been waiting for my call. How's it going? Well, you know, I'm just sitting here with my clients, going over both the contracts, and I got to tell you, they're really similar. And you know, there's some components of your offer that uh, that that we like, and then there's some components of uh, of the other offer that we like better. But you know, one of the areas that your offer falls short is uh, is in the numbers. I said there's a significant difference between your numbers and the other offer's numbers. Now, common practice, nice. and this is what the people would, would do, this is what my clients wanted to do. Let's call them and tell them the other one's 502 and tell them that no. they have to come up and match it. <laughs> well, no, then you give away your position. Yeah. Why would you use a number, right? I love the word significant. There's a significant difference yeah. between your offer and the other one when it comes it, to the numbers. It could have been lower. What I'd like <laughs> you to do, you don't have to make it, you know, we're not making a decision right this minute. Take 10 minutes, talk about it with your clients, call me back, let me know if you guys would like to alter your offer in any way. I haven't given them a counter offer, mm -hmm. just had a conversation. Well, what happens 10 minutes later, both, both calls come back in. The higher offer does alter their dates. So now we know, well, if we have to move forward with this one, we've got everything we want. But the other offer calls back and says, hey, Andrew, like, we're hoping that this is going to be good enough because we really want this home. We'll come to 505. $3,000 higher than the other offer and about $9,000 higher than they were on their original offer. In that moment, what did I say? I don't go, thank you very much, done deal. I said, okay, <laughs> hey, you know what? I really appreciate that. I'm gonna finish having this conversation with my clients. We'll get back to you shortly. They're still thinking they don't have it. Uh -huh. Right, they're still going, holy crap. So, you know, we did the deal. We worked with those guys, sold home. You know, everything went really well. Bottom line is this, shut up. Let the other side talk first. Don't give away any information. Giving away information reveals your position. And you never know what you might get when you let the other side talk first. Okay, I know we've run into time here. Are we are we done? Well, you can, these are the guys you have to ask for permission. They're, they're the ones. Mm -hmm. let, me, let, me, let, me, let me give you a quick conclusion, okay? Obama did not have all the facts. He didn't have all the figures, and he didn't have all the answers. But he still controlled the moment. And we discussed a number of the elements as to how he controlled the moment. When we understand effective communication, we don't need all the answers. When you communicate the right way, you can help your audience feel the right way about the unknown. A common trap 
we can fall into as industry professionals and as communicators in general is that we need to be the people with the facts. We need to have all the answers. And that is completely incorrect. You need to have complete command of your language, your body, your profession, your knowledge, so that you can control environments and situations and lead people in how they feel. You cannot change the facts. You cannot change the figures. But if you understand what people need in order to move forward, you can control and help them feel right moving forward. And that is what Obama accomplished beautifully in three minutes and 30 seconds. And that's what you can learn to do in your industries and your professions if you learned if you learn to communicate with intent and purpose. There you go. Thank you very much. Awesome.